Welcome all to the latest of our webinar series, our quarterly legal update. Uh, David, good morning. How's, how's, how's things? How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Happy to Ollie to everybody as well. Seems like <laughs> oh, being very, very inclusive today. Happy to Ollie to our potential new prime minister as well, who may well be being in play by two o'clock. Oh, there we go. Yeah, already uh, alluding to the such an uneventful week that we've had. Um, but but oh, there we go. The quiet, the quiet weekend. Yeah. Yeah, exactly that. I'm sure we'll get into that a, a bit later. Um, but yeah, guys, welcome everyone. Um, just before we we get into things, just some some housekeeping as always. So, how to interact with us today on on this quarterly legal compliance update webinar? Uh, is as usual in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen on Zoom. Uh, please do submit your questions via there. Um, very much these webinars as they have been in the past and will continue to be so uh, a knowledge sharing base for, for us in our industry. Um, so very much that kind of better together piece and, and pushing on. So do please get involved as, as much as you can. And the second thing, which I will just mention is of course, from a disclaimer standpoint, so all content presented in this webinar is intended for general information purposes only, and should not be considered as legal advice or official guidance. Um, so please consult legal counsel as in, as and when needed. Um, but brilliant. Now that's that's that out of the way. Um, just to introduce myself briefly, my name is Will Arrowsmith. I'm I'm head of sales here at Fixflow. Um, but much more important than than myself, uh, David. Good good morning again. Um, and do you want to just do a, a quick introduction for those who who don't know you are? Yeah, Ra Raj has, has stepped down and been replaced by Will. The only, <laughs> the only sad continuity in these webinars is me. <laughs> Um, so I'm a partner at JNW Solicitors, and apparently I know things about residential landlord and tenant law, though I frequently like to say much less than people think. Oh, there we go. What a great way to start. <laughs> um, brilliant stuff. So in terms of what we're gonna gonna cover today, of course, yeah, not much has happened at all. Um, but the key kind of five things, and we've got them here on the screen. So just with the new uh, carbon monoxide alarm amendment regulations coming in from the first of October, uh, the key kind of big latest change in our industry we're just going to cover over that a bit to begin with um and just dive into and make sure we have all our kind of t's crossed and, and i's dotted when it comes to that piece of things um then of course yeah bits and pieces renters reform uh the parliament break that we had to go into the party conferences so dive into those a bit as well and then of course at the end any any questions but to kick us off um yeah carbon monoxide alarm regulations and, and the amendment of course the addition to smoke and alarm regulations of, of 2015 and came into effect from from the 1st of October. Um, so David, if, if you don't mind, just a, a summary perhaps of, of what's required um, and, and we'll kind of launch in from, yeah, from there. Yeah, so this is, this is mostly a reminder, of course. So from the 1st of October, all rented residential property in both the social sector and the private sector must have at least one carbon monoxide alarm um, in any room with a fuel burning appliance. So previously it was a solid fuel burning appliance that we were interested in. Now it's all fuel burning appliances. Um, the only exception to that is you don't have to do it if you have a gas hob. So that's not relevant, but a gas boiler, an oil fired, fired boiler, uh, all of these things, any room with, with such appliances must have a carbon monoxide alarm. Um, the, the only situation where you wouldn't have a carbon monoxide alarm in a property now is where it's entirely heated by electricity and, and all its water comes from electricity and it's it's a pure electric um, situation. Perfect. Um, and in terms of guidance on the specifics of the um, the alarm regulator, am I right to say it could be battery powered, electric, there's no kind of specifics on, on that? There were encouragements in terms of, of which way to go? Uh, it, the government's entirely neutral whether it's battery or mains powered. Um, and, and the same with smoke alarms, they could still be battery powered. In Wales, from the 1st of December, the similar rules will be coming in, but their smoke alarms will have to be mains powered with battery backup. Uh, but in England, it can be battery powered. In fact, in practice, you find most carbon monoxide alarms come with a fixed five-year battery. Um, the other um, thing you need to be aware of is that the structure's changed a bit. If, a, if an alarm is non-functional, then um, a landlord is obligated on report to repair it. Now, what's unclear about this is, does that include you changing the batteries in the smoke alarm? Um, the, 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 the position is unclear on that, but I, I think it probably does. 
Um, and I would certainly say that the best thing to do would probably just to put new batteries and smoke alarms at the start of each tenancy would be the, the simplest resolution. Um, but people have, have got a bit blasé about all this stuff. So it's quite important you um, people are getting on top of it. I mean, carbon monoxide is, is a serious, serious cause of death in the UK. And it's important that people take it seriously. Um, local authorities do have the power to come in and fit carbon monoxide alarms for you or simply fine you up to £5,000. And, and I've already seen indications from some local authorities that they will be doing so. That's interesting. And indications, is that kind of threats already of, of fines or just putting their kind of foot firmly out in front and stating uh, what, what they expect? It's threats of fines. So I've seen threats already of fines um, from one or two local authorities. I mean, whether they were that, how serious they were is another matter. But and inevitably, I think what will tend to happen in this situation is not that local authorities will go around and start checking for carbon monoxide alarms. But what you'll see is where a local authority has cause to visit someone's property, they'll, be a, they'll get a letter saying, I had cause to visit your property for this. And while I was there, I noticed you didn't have a carbon monoxide alarm. So here's a quick fine to get us started. While I consider what other fines I'm going to levy on you for the other stuff. <laughs> there we go um brilliant and and speaking to just a few clients over the, the past few weeks actually there's not quite confusion but the kind of hmo piece and i know it's slightly different um there's kind of caveats when it when it comes to that do you mind just kind of go into a bit yeah. more detail on on that the, for us? These, these regs don't apply to licensable hmos because in those cases it is a condition of your hmo license now rather perversely and this happened with the icrs as well mm -hmm. um that means that it won't be in effect until your HMO license is renewed. Um, so there's a weird um, uh, gap there, but um, obviously that that will come to pass in time. And in some cases, it won't matter because these were already in HMO license conditions anyway. Mm -hmm. um, quite a few local authorities had a carbon monoxide alarm condition in place. Okay, so hopefully not not new really, um, but just confirmation of, of those bits and pieces there. Um, Perfect. And I guess it's perfect on the HMO piece. Um, oh, quick question coming in already, which is great. Let me just pick that one up there. But on the HMO piece, before I go into that question, David, I, I understand you have a have a book coming out soon on this matter of fact entirely. <laughs> well, I'm on HMOs. Um, so yeah, I've, I've co-authored a book uh, that's published as of, as of today. I think you can buy it uh, by there. Routledge with my associate solicitor, Nelly, Nelly Barisova. Uh, on HMOs and selective licensing, which which is by no means the last word on the matter, I hasten to add, but it it would bring most people up to date on where we stand on most of these issues right now, or at least where we stood last week when I or last couple of weeks when I wrote it. <laughs> Scenario it seems to change so terribly often, nearly as often as the prime minister. Oh, there we go. That's the first time that's been slotted in. First of many, I'm sure. Um, but Dave, we've got a got a question from from the audience today. So, is there any guidance on where the carbon monoxide alarm should be placed does it have to be within a certain distance of of the appliance not um not not um not official guidance i understand that that, that some i mean no doubt manufacturers have views on this i understand it's within a couple of meters mm -hmm. of the appliance i mean there's obviously some caveats in this if a if a gas boiler is in a hallway or in a cupboard off a hallway, then you have to put the carbon monoxide alarm in the hallway. So there are mm -hmm. there are some things that are specified in the regs, but there are no there are no, there's no formal full guidance on this at the current time. There is in Wales, ironically, but but that's because because of, of differences between the way the different governments operate. But not in England. But I understand that some manufacturers do have guidance, and and you should be following that. Brilliant. That's really useful. And yeah, just to. I suppose clear this. It's one of the our most popular guides here at Fixed Flow, our carbon monoxide alarm amendment regulation guide. Um, I think it's been downloaded over a thousand times already. So feel free, yeah, just jump on the Fixed Flow website. Fixed Flow has guidance. There you go. Follow <laughs> <All of> that. <laughs> Great stuff. Um, and David, just a, another quick quick one finally on here. So just as mentioned, you mentioned kind of gas hobs. Just double checking that would also include full gas cookers. So gas yeah, gas cooking cooking. appliances. Sorry, I, I'm I'm just I'm just uh, talking about my own kitchen, which has a gas hob and electric <laughs> oven. So, so yeah, gas cooking appliances um, uh, are exempt. Although ironically, not in Wales, but that's a, a totally separate discussion. There we go. Brilliant. So hopefully that's that's clear on on that one. But that's great. Thank you very much for yeah, kind of clarification on on that piece. Um, moving on to the next 
kind of big, I suppose, topic, one that seems to just continually come up since middle of June when when the white paper was was released. Um, renters reform and everything, renters reform in section 21 and no fault evictions and, and everything and how, how long we could go on for this. Um, but I know wow. that in, sorry, in our, um, in Q2 when, when we did this webinar, when you did it with Raj, you were very keen to reiterate that it was a long way off from becoming a bill, I guess, with everything going on, that's, that's still the case. Has your position changed on that at all? Yeah, well, I mean, I think people need to be clear that there is no renters reform bill. There is a white paper on fairer renting. A white paper is not a bill. And in fact, the white paper suggests that there may be more than one piece of legislation doing more than one thing. And I wouldn't assume, one, that everything in the white paper will be real. That white papers are suggestions and proposals. They are not by any means uh, a suggestion of, of final legislation. Um, and, and two, I wouldn't assume that it will all happen at the same time. Um, so if we just run through the different things that are in the, the white paper, obviously there's getting rid of section 21, which is got a lot of press time. Mm -hmm. um, linked to that, but slightly separately, is the idea of tenancies being periodic from the start. So no fixed term tenancies. Now those are often run together, but I, I, I would say that those are two entirely different things. And getting rid of section 21 is infinitely more likely than um, than, a, than, a, than periodic tenancies from the get-go, for example. Um, then you've got the decent home standard uh, in the PRS. Um, I think that's relatively likely to happen. A consultation is just closed on that, so there's obviously real commitment to that. Um, you've got um, uh, 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 the, the landlord portal, I mean, the landlord register by another name, the property portal. Mm -hmm. Quite a lot of work has been done on that already behind the scenes. I understand that there are already uh, test versions of the of the software in place. So that's obviously got a high level of commitment to it. Um, and then you've got the sort of odd bod things like um, pets, pets in properties and things like that, which I don't think there's a, a huge amount of commitment to, I'm afraid. And, <laughs> and they may happen, but I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily put money on it. They're not they're not big ticket items. Now, the problem with all of this, of course, is that is that housing and property are intensely political. And, um, and, and inevitably, what also changes, of course, is every time you change the minister in charge of this stuff, you change the, the game. So this has all started out under Michael Gove as Secretary of State. Um, we're already two secretaries of state further on since then. There was the interim position uh, as, the, uh, as Boris's government collapsed. Truss appointed a, a chap who um, has spent the weekend tweeting about how much he wants to support Boris. So um, I, I'm not sure that his his lifetime is is going to be high under a, a prime minister who's clearly not going to be Boris. Um, and, and so you've got to ask yourself what the level of commitment will be from the newest uh, prime minister and his secretary of state. I mean, it was notable that under the Truss government, uh, a, a, story emerged in the Sunday Times, which is pretty obviously leaked out of number 10, frankly, that they weren't going to go ahead with getting rid of Section 21. And um, that caused a bit of an outcry. And this trust was forced to almost instantly reverse that in PMQs and say they were getting rid of it. And you just don't know where a new prime minister will stand. Mm -hmm. Rishi Sunak, as a rule, has been pretty quiet on this kind of stuff. But you can assume the Treasury was probably consulted before the Fair Renting White Paper was published when he was Chancellor, and he probably signed off on it. So the, the, there'll certainly be some level of commitment within, within his government to, to some of this stuff. But um, the question is, will it be commitment to all of it? And obviously, you've got to bear in mind from a Prime Minister who's a former Chancellor, his first eye is likely to be on the economic effect. So, so does getting rid of Section 21 help or hinder the economy? There are now there are there are two very divergent schools of thought on that. <laughs> um, one group would say it's good for the economy because it encourages tenants to feel secure in their properties and therefore it's good for growth, which is a perfectly valid argument. Another group would say it discourages landlords from providing houses. So so it's bad for the economy. So there's two there's two very divergent schools of thought on that. Um, and then you've got other sort of side issues, like for example, court funding. And, and, it, and I also think a lot of the problems people complain about Section 21 are more to do with with, um, with the, the way the court system is funded and functions. 
mm-hmm. than they are necessarily to do with Section 21. People often complain about Section 21 going away and say how terrible it would be, but most of their complaints are actually proxies for something else. Interesting. Um, and, and, and usually for the courts being being too slow. Um, and the white paper did have various commitments to an improved court funding, but you know <laughs> that was before the economy fell apart and uh, <laughs> and interest rates went through the roof. So um, you can't really say that, that the government's very likely to put money into stuff. I mean, there's there's still widespread talk of further austerity, and the court service will feel feel the brunt of that, just like everybody else. Sure. So, um, I think uh, it's still early days. We need to wait and see who's who is going to be prime minister this afternoon. My money's on Rishi Sunak, but you never can tell. Mm-hmm. Um, and and also, what what the reshuffle looks like as the as the week emerges. Who is going to be Secretary of State for for leveling up housing communities? What's their past history? Are they more interested in leveling up housing communities? Mm-hmm. Um, and does their commitment to housing extend mostly to saying let's build more houses so people can buy them or does it extend more to towards the PRS uh, one of the things that was notable as you move towards into the trust government was commitment to housing was about building houses mm-hmm. for, for people to buy um, and so there was a disinterest again in the PRS um, whether that will be the position um, by the end of the week is another matter so sure. so so things like white papers are very dependent on government focus no completely i guess i guess to bring it to, to kind of back to real world implications as it as it were for, for ourselves but you kind of so section 21 and the abolition of that um they're kind of a mixture of new grounds and modifications being introduced into to section eight and there were kind of bits and pieces on that the key the key changes that we'd see there were well, some of those are freestanding. So, so part of the commitment was to simply get rid of of, of the um, of various traps for the unwary. So, for example, if you want to move back into a property for occupation yourself, mm-hmm. there is a ground for possession. People kept saying, "Oh, we need a ground so that I can move back into my house myself." But there is one. There always has been. Um, but the difficulty with it is you have to serve notice before the tenancy began that you might rely on it, and people mm-hmm. often don't. So. Part of the commitment was to get rid of those traps. Now, that's actually got nothing to do with Section 21. You could get rid of those traps regardless. Um, There was a commitment to um, uh, a new ground for possession where someone has been in rent arrears, uh, serious rent arrears, three times in a year. Um, Whether that's a particularly useful ground or not is another another matter. I think it probably helped a small number of landlords, but probably quite a small number. Um, You could do that regardless of whether you get rid of Section 21. There was a somewhat nebulous commitment to improve um, evictions for antisocial behaviour. How you would actually do that is, is, again, is is another another unclear matter, but you could do that uh, uh, independently of Section 21. And then finally, there was some sort of ground possession being mooted for people who were planning to sell. Now, what's unclear about that it's the intent to sell question, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's what level of intent is required. For example, at the moment, if I want to, if I want to move back into property uh, to live there myself, all I'm required to do is provide a witness statement to the court saying I intend to do that, mm-hmm. um, with the caveat that if I lie to the court, that's contempt and I can go to prison for it. Um, most people don't lie in practice. I mean, I know people think everyone lies in court, but in practice, relatively few people tell out-and-out lies in court. Mm-hmm. Um, but there is some evidence from Scotland where similar grounds possession exist, although it's a bit it's a bit difficult to follow that evidence through because we're talking about a relatively small number of cases and so on. Um, that that up to a third of properties that um, that were where where, where, where landlords said they were going to sell have not in fact been sold. Okay. So it's unclear whether you have to, for example, produce a letter from an agent saying that you've signed with an agent and properties on the market. Mm-hmm. Or you need a, a an offer, or you have to have exchanged contracts. But if you have all of those caveats in there, that's going to make it very difficult. Because normally, if you sell a house on the current market, people expect to be able to view it and buy it, not mm-hmm. view it and buy it in three or four months' time once you've evicted the existing tenants. And um, agents are are going to be very cool on taking properties on or, that are in that position it causes problems for agents who mostly have six or 12 week exclusivity period in their contracts if they then have to sit with properties on their books for a couple of months they'll lose their exclusivity period so they might have to revise their contracts 
Um, if I have to exchange contracts, then, then I'm going to have to have very, very long delays between exchange and completion. That's difficult for agents who, of course, have to wait for their money. And it also is difficult for mortgage companies, which don't tend to offer mortgage offers for that length of time, mm -hmm. especially not when interest rates are unpredictable. Yep. Um, and it's difficult for buyers who don't, gen and for vendors as well, of course, who don't, generally don't want to hang about that long. No. So there are real dangers if the government turns around and creates a system where people have to wait an extended period of time between a property putatively being purchased and actually getting their hands on the keys and adding more delays into the conveyancing system doesn't seem like um, a great way to go. No, certainly not. Um, thank you for that. Yeah, much more clarity is, is needed, I think, in, in summary on that one, and we'll hopefully find out as, as time passes. Um, we've had a, a question from from in, in the webinar sorry i can't see people's names i do apologize um but i've got a got a question here so we issued a section 21 to a tenant on the 23rd of august she is now she's not vacated and is now in just shy of two and a half grand in arrears um the rent is 1100 or 1150 pounds a month should we issue now issue a section eight or proceed to court landlord does not wish to take up occupation what do you thoughts on that one if i haven't been clear to maybe I'm, I'm just confused it. by the question i don't understand why you wouldn't just go to the section 21 um there's um often confusion about this and that people sometimes think that section 21 notices don't allow you to seek possession uh sorry sorry to seek um uh money alongside possession whereas they they do um the, the problem is that um, Section 21 notices, if you go to accelerated possession proceedings, you're not able to seek, seek uh, money in accelerated possession proceedings, um, but you are on traditional possession proceedings. So but there's no reason why you can't go to court for possession and money on a Section 21 notice. You don't need a Section 8 notice as well. Um, and, yeah. and Section 21 is not going to disappear so soon that you need to worry <laughs> about it disappearing. I don't, I don't know the question is being asked because they don't know how that works or they think the Section 21 is going to be taken away from them at some point uh, yeah. under the law. There's no, there's no danger of Section 21 disappearing in the next few months because, you know, white paper to bill, to act, to implementation, in the white paper, the government committed to at least six months between, um, between the, the act being passed and... Um, and it, and it coming into effect anyway. So you're going to get at least six months warning and they committed to over a year in respect of any retrospective effect. And it's quite likely they would, in, in the end, I think probably allow for more. I mean, if you look at the Deregulation Act, it had a three-year transition period. Mm -hmm. I suspect you'll find they'll end up with a much longer transition period than, than is currently being muted. But there's no danger of of this coming into effect really at this stage until 2024, I wouldn't have thought. And you've got to bear in mind that, that you know there's now a whole load of stuff that's stacked up on the government's plate that should have been resolved months ago, but isn't. Mm -hmm. um, there are flagship bills they want to get through that, are, that, are, that they place a much higher priority on than, um, than uh, housing. You've got a budget to coming up next month that has to have an, a, whole, a whole piece of legislation to go with it. Mm -hmm. uh, which tends to take up a lot of parliamentary time. Um, and we're not so very far away from the next general election, in, in, no. in, poli in political terms at least. It may feel like a long time to a lot of people, but <laughs> politics terms is not that far off at all. Um, so, um, you know, th th this is the trouble with these sort of things, is that governments may have high-minded ambitions and talk about getting rid of Section 21, but parliamentary time is, is scarce. And there's a lot of other stuff that has to get in there first before relatively low ranking departments like DLO, DLUHC get a, get a turn. Mm -hmm. and, and certainly if a bill has contro controversial issues in it, they're less likely to get parliamentary time, which is why I, 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 I suspect that, that, that you'll find the renters reform white paper is going to get chopped up. And the less controversial stuff like decent home standard or the property portal, which people are pretty calm about as a rule, Mm -hmm. um we'll get chunked through oh, interesting. interesting thank you for that i guess the the final thing just on rent reform just the om ombudsman you mentioned at the beginning do you think that will change the relationship at all amongst kind of renters agents landlords what what kind of impact do you feel that could could possibly have 
Well, that's a complex one. One, it depends who ends up being the ombudsman, and two, it depends mm-hmm. what their what kind of stuff they want to deal with. The, the difficulty for an ombudsman is 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 immediately you're 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 giving people multiple routes to resolve their problems. Mm-hmm. Um, should an ombudsman, for example, deal with disputes from tenants about disrepair in properties, or should that in fact be dealt with by the courts? What power will the ombudsman have to make a landlord repair property? And if the landlord just ignores it, will they have any ability to enforce it? Or will the tenant end up back in court anyway, um, seeking an order from the court that the landlord repairs the property? So <laughs> you've got these, these and, and equally, what happens if the tenant says, well, I've got a disrepair complaint. The landlord responds to them saying, well, I've got a, a rent arrears complaint and it's already on its way to court. You shouldn't deal with this. Um, how are you going to deal with that? Interesting. Um, final one here, just another question from, from the audience. So I think we kind of kind of touched upon this, but I guess it's a asking you to predict time scale. So if, if the renters reform white paper becomes a, a quote unquote bill, um, what is the anticipated time scale to proceed through to enacted law? You kind of mentioned earliest 2024 there, your, your gut feel is, but I, do I, I don't think it will become a bill. Mm-hmm. Um, it kind of depends what you're talking about. Um, you've got to have consultations on the various elements, and I think the government have a further consultation on parts of it. Mm-hmm. Um, you've then got to present a bill to Parliament, get through all three readings, and then have an implementation uh, uh, timescale. I, I don't see that happening um, in time to get you in play before 2024, at best. And that's with it, as you kind of said, being chopped up to an extent. Yeah, I mean, I can see bits of it coming into place before 2024. I'm not sure that all of it would. Yeah. Anyway, well, thank you. thank you very much for that. I guess the the next thing to to move on to, and with the kind of parliamentary break um, and the party conferences that that took place, um, I guess the, the key thing that's impacting you've you've touched upon it already a, a bit, but it's the, the kind of conservative fiscal policy perspective and and what kind of impact that'll that'll have on. I guess we spoke about it in bit relation to renters reform, but just the industry in, in general. I mean, the Conservative Party conference was a bit difficult because it was it it, it became such a a, a a fest of 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 really the economy. It was very difficult to get people to talk about much else. So it's really unclear what conservative policy is on housing. It's it's all over the place, depending on which wing of the party has control and and um, obviously Rishi Sunak was there during. Boris's government. Does that mean that that the kind of stuff, including, for example, the fair renting white paper that came out during Boris's government, is now going to be back on the table, or, or not? It also, I mean, it also depends whether he tries to make up a cabinet largely of of loyalists, which is fairly centrist people, or whether he's going to take people across different wings of the party. In which case, you you could end up, I don't know, Jacob Rees Mogg could be. DLUHC secretary, <laughs> in which case I don't see section 21 disappearing. So, you know, um, you, you really don't know yet. Um, I mean, let's be honest, Rishi Sunak may not be prime minister. I mean, you, you just don't know for sure. It could be Penny Morden by the end of the week and, and she's got mm-hmm. a somewhat different position altogether. So you, it's, it's really difficult to say where the government is going to be at the current time. But I, I just wouldn't assume that section 21 is gone. It's a good note there. I guess um at least not under this government. No. I guess this is neatly to the Labour Party. <laughs> <laughs> That's just before we jump into that. I know it's been kind of offline before, but the kind of stamp duty holiday and bits and pieces like that. Do you feel any impact will come in from that? Anything will change initially? Well, the economy is quite an interesting position. I mean, there's a, a wider question here, which is what level of commitments the landlords have to the sector. You've got you've got three effects kicking on here. Some landlords are looking to leave the sector because increasing regulation makes them feel like it's not worth it. Mm -hmm. Um, Some landlords, I suspect, will now find themselves unable to easily continue in the sector because as they come to remortgage, they will not be able to obtain mortgage deals that they previously had and the economics will not work for them. Um, Landlords potentially looking to enter the sector may find themselves discouraged from doing so by not being able to achieve the mortgage deals they previously had. I mean... People underestimate the effect of cheap money on, on the growth of the PRS. It's, it's generally seems it's been all about regulation, but actually the growth of cheap money has been a huge uh, driver for the size of the size of the PRS. As soon as that goes away, I think you'll find that will change the dynamic. 
as against that, obviously, um, Liz Truss's government <laughs> announced a reduction in stamp duty, which is not easily reversed because it's already in play. Mm -hmm. Um, and stamp duty has an, an, an overweening effect and, and really one far beyond the amount of money involved in encouraging or discouraging action in the housing sector. Now, I was chatting to my conveyance this morning who say that who tell me they're a lot quieter. So maybe it's not having such a substantial effect now. Mm -hmm. um, but all of these things weigh in and it's it's interesting. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out in terms of investment in the sector, whether it be mostly first time buyers or or whether landlords will still look to enter the sector or, or whether people will start to draw in their horns. And, and of course, as against that, you've just got the most ridiculous number of tenants demanding property. So, mm. so obviously that's an encouragement to enter the sector because rents are going through the roof and that's not going to go away anytime soon. No, of course not. And I think with, of course, the everything that was put in place in, in 2020, 2021, and now in 2022 regarding stamp duty in general these kind of holidays that will people always feel they're coming and will we get a, a boom and bust element where there is pent-up demand because they're holding on for a for a holiday that perhaps they feel is they feel is coming because it feels like it's a bit of a a knee-jerk reaction perhaps now when the economy needs to be stimulated oh we know that works last time what are, what are you going to well yeah we, we talked about this in rehearsal didn't we this idea mm. of, the, of the of the sort of black friday sale element <laughs> of the of of the of the of house but say and, and you just can't be sure i mean it, 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 i'm not a huge fan of stamp duty but i'm not a huge fan of transactional taxes in general mm -hmm. um but i think that worse than that is the way that the government continually plays with stamp duty um mm -hmm. in order to to achieve effects and 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 heating and cooling the housing market is not terribly productive mm -hmm. um and it doesn't really lead to what we actually need which is a long-term supply of property with with relatively stable fixed elements of churn there's insufficient churn in the housing sector in the uk not, not enough houses are being bought sold rented there's not enough movement mm -hmm. um and that's a side effect of insufficient stock in, in my opinion obviously people could disagree with that to the heart's content um, I don't think that a that a an on again off again approach to stamp duty is a particularly useful way of 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 managing that that problem. And and it also it also frankly belittles the sector and the market generally because it's a far more complex uh, thing involving yes. involving other taxes involving developers involving planning control. Um, so to suggest that, that stamp duty is the only answer is is a bit a bit sort of trivializing yeah completely we all know it's not turning off and turning on again a tap to an extent um but interesting point i guess moving on to the the labor party conference as well just to hinge on something you just mentioned that kind of not enough movement in the market um and i guess the key thing that's been kind of bounded around we've seen it in scotland already but but rent controls do you do you kind of feel that would hinder that help that what are, what are your kind of thoughts more, more broadly on, on rent controls as well well, I mean, there's a couple of things to, to be clear. I mean, at the end of the day, as 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 has been described, the Labour Party currently, at least, is looking like a government in waiting and and mm. and is literally waiting for the next general election. In, in I think it's early 24. I think is the day it has to happen. Um, and the Labour Party was abundantly clear at their conference that they will be getting rid of Section 21. Um, so I don't think Section 21 is going to last forever, though I would note, again, this is why I drew a distinction earlier, there is a difference between getting rid of Section 21 and having fixed term tenancies from the start, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, periodic tenancies from the start, so getting rid of fixed term tenancies. The Labour Party is by no means as committed to getting rid of fixed term tenancies as they are to getting rid of Section 21. Um, and they are by no means committed to SNP policies. So Scotland, of course, has got rid of Section 21 equivalents and has got rid of fixed term tenancies. That is an SNP policy. I wouldn't assume that uh, the Labour Party would necessarily follow that policy in England. Mm -hmm. um, rent control is a difficult one. I mean, uh, talking about Scotland just for a minute, Scotland has, has introduced what is, what is in the trade is termed third generation rent control. That means that, that rents are controlled inside a tenancy, um, usually by linking to RPI. At the moment, it's been linked to, an, to a figure, uh, an, an allowed increase figure, which in Scotland at the moment is 0%. But, um, but you can link it to other figures, and RPI would be the traditional, or CPI would be the traditional figure. Mm -hmm. But then they, the, the, the rents free float between tenancies. 
Now, this was has been tried a lot. Berlin had this mis- system in place until relatively recently. They abandoned it because it doesn't really work. Um, and it's been tried in uh, California a couple of times. And there are a couple of things you tend to find. Um, one, and most importantly, tenants tend not to move. Um, it's already the case, and, and people will be who are listening to this will be well aware of this, that landlords tend to hold rents down during tenancies. And, and therefore, if tenants stay in a property, they are likely to pay less than they will have to pay if they float out into the market. Mm. Um, so that that is already a, a known factor. Now, that actually is causing problems right now, both in Scotland and also in London, because you tend to find that where there's a shortage of property and, and rents start going up, uh, tenants who might have otherwise moved choose not to and stay in their property because they think it'll be they, they perceive it will be cheaper and they're often cracked. And so you then end up with even less supply being available for people who want to come into the, into the market. You tend to find that um, third gen rent control exacerbates that effect. And people who who would otherwise move and should move often for economic reasons, either to uh, move in with a partner and move their lives forward or to move for job purposes. Mm-hmm. Um, will tend not to um, because because it's, it's obviously financially far better for them to stay exactly where they are in their current tenancy rather than pay a free floating market rent. Now, what that, of course, means is there's an insufficient supply of property available for people who want to enter the sector, which means that market rents go up even more and you end up with a, with a, a, a less than virtuous circle. You end up with a bit of a death spiral situation where rents just go up more and more and more and people are mm-hmm. less and less motivated to move and you risk market collapse. So the adverse so, effect. No, yeah. Sure. And, and of course, the other problem about, about third gen rent control is in fact, what you tend to find is over the longer term, rents tend to, to move up at approximately the same degree anyway, because the market still jumps in and increases rents mm-hmm. between tenancies. So if, if, so if people are moving and you don't end up in this spiral with tenants never moving, what actually happens is rents tend to go up at the same uh, at the same rate over a longer period of time, just in a slightly more predictable way. Mm. So, so there's elements of rent control that, you know, for, for some landlords, rent control is not necessarily a problem. If I if I was to turn around to you and say, well, rents will increase every year by RPI plus one percent year on year, and mm-hmm. you know you're allowed to increase your rent annually, that's not necessarily a big problem for many landlords because all they would do is just increase the rent, which they don't, often don't do now. And they'd probably get the same amount of money and they do quite well because they would actually have predictable rent increases and wouldn't yeah, be subject to, uh, to market variability. So there's actually <laughs> an element in which it's, it's going to be quite a good thing from a landlord's perspective. Um, obviously, clear a clear rent increase structure also can be predictable from a tenant's perspective, but very few rent control mechanisms aspire to that. Um, and there is a problem with third gen rent control as it, it tends to actually exacerbate a short a lack of churn in the market and where you've already got that happening as you do in scotland right now mm-hmm. you may actually make your situation many many times worse and what i think would be really interesting will, will be to see whether scotland actually has just managed to make its situation worse not better um the labor party blows hot and cold on rent control i i'm not at all convinced that a keir starmer government would be terribly committed to introducing rent control in england do you and think you, you, you can you get this quite complex discussion of what sort of rent control. So, so third gen rent control is 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 more popular at the moment, but actually most people have abandoned it. And then then your next option is second generation rent control, where you where you start um, fixing uh, rent increases across the board um, by by some fixed level. But that's very very difficult to implement. Mm. And just on. I was looking back to, to Scotland there because that's the nearest example we can kind of see going on at, at the moment. End, end of March, is it? It ends, I think. Um, well, the, the, the legislation they put in place does two things, actually. It it, um, it slows down evictions. It, it basically means you have to have much more rent arrears and give much longer notice. You're on six months' notice. It, um, it um, uh, also introduces rent control. Currently, all of that stuff runs to March next year, but it can actually be extended out to March 24, um, without the consent of um, the Scots, the Scots Parliament. Um, beyond that point, you would have to get more legislation passed, and I, I would hazard that they probably will try and extend it. Actually, Thanks, not, not in Parliament, but I think Scottish ministers will extend it. Reasons being for that, you think there's not enough time for them to 
to kind of see the effects as it were or yeah i just don't think that i don't think you've seen much change in uh, yeah. over the winter into march next year Brilliant. um i guess the final point on rent control is is it did give everyone our favorite sitcom sitcom even in the in the form of friends and oh, new york and bits and pieces. Friends i do i think you should <laughs> i mean i mean the other thing that about rent control is is um is you tend to find that 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 it leads to inappropriate um, means of securing property. So we've already seen in London uh, people talking about property auditions, tenants offering vast amounts of rent in advance to try and yep. get over the next person. New York has had partial rent control for a great many years, and and it, it tends to lead to a lot of problems. And 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 yes, as I, I said before, Friends <laughs> is actually partially built on. On, on on this situation and it and it's kind of lost on a British audience, but the concept is is very, very well understood to an American audience. Mm. Um, and Rachel and Monica and friends are living in their grandmother's house and are pretending she's there <laughs> in order to take advantage of the fact the property is rent controlled. Um, and then there's another great story where Ross wants to get a new house and there's they're all people are all giving muffins and things to the guy who's moving out in order to be his selected replacement in order to take advantage of his rent control property so what you end up with in these situations is, is potentially a, an even worse scenario of of landlord auditions or rents in advance or you know wildly less appropriate things that, that occur um in order to um in order to get first in the in a, in a putative queue and and, mm-hmm. and and rent control potentially makes that situation worse if it reduces the availability of supply and, and cuts churn out. I mean, imagine, for example, groups of sharers choosing their next sharer on the bay and, 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 and people being desperate to get into a rent controlled property with other sharers and maintain that rent control and, and, and what might be demanded or offered at that point. And landlords become victims of that too. Yeah, that's I not, guess that's not that's not simply a great scenario for landlords writ large. That is potentially a, a situation where landlords are liable to fraud. Completely. And I guess the, the geographical definitions of where these rent control barriers are and these lines are is always something that would be hotly debated. Well, I mean, I mean the other problem here, of course, is is um is what I haven't talked about is the idea of of, of geographically bounded rent control. I mean, I, I'm mm. saying Scotland has rent control, obviously. It doesn't matter, particularly in Edinburgh, that that uh, Carlisle doesn't have rent control. Obviously, it matters more and more as you get closer and closer to the border. <laughs> um, but um, the one that I think is far more disturbing is the idea that London might have rent control, whereas Surrey or Buckinghamshire or Kent didn't. Mm-hmm. Um, that is that is actually quite dangerous. Um, from the point of view of, of outer London economies, because it means that people who, uh, you know, normally at the moment you tend to get a bit of a flow of people moving out of London as they get a bit, a bit older and settle mm-hmm. down and move into move into the suburbs. Um, clearly, if you have rent control in London, you potentially disrupt that flow, which is actually it's quite a good thing. Um, you disrupt the outflow of money from London into into the surrounding home counties, which is which is generally speaking a good thing in, in stopping too much wealth being concentrated just in London. It spreads it a little bit, even if it's only to the southeast. Um, so I think there are real risks associated with with a London only rent control. Although, I, I, if I'm honest, I don't think the mayor is actually serious about it. No. Um, well, see, I think it's, it's people's question times in the next couple of weeks. I think so. It'll be interesting to see see if that comes up at all there um and David, well thank you very much for, for all of that i guess that that kind of wraps up our piece on, on party conferences there um just coming on to to conclude briefly before we kind of open up the floor for the last 10 minutes of, of questions and bits and pieces is there a kind of concluding statement that you'd like to give on, on the status of the industry or is there perhaps one more thing you'd like to share with us before before we conclude i, just, I, just, I think as, as i was saying to people last week I was, I was actually speaking on friday um before and liz trust i think and, and resigned an hour before and yep. that's before we got into the weekends ups <laughs> and downs i think we we're just in a really fluid situation which i think will persist for about a month mm-hmm. uh, until we see what what whether the new government is a going to survive mm-hmm. um um, and and B, whether it's going to um, to, uh, to 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 persist, and, and and what its policies are going to be. 
Please, um, please. And until until we see that, it's really difficult to know what 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 elements of the white paper are likely to be taken forward or ditched, or whether something new will come along. I mean, the other danger in all these situations is a new minister comes in, new broom, throws the white paper in the bin, and starts again. Don't say that. There we go. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm I'm a lawyer. Uncertainty is generally good from perspective. <laughs> Um, really, and I guess um, do you think I saw something quite interesting in the property industry I actually this morning so in September to September from 2021 to 2022 so with 37% down in terms of sales and and instructions that well sales that went through um, but of course we did have the mad rush in September of 2021 with the stamp duty holiday 37% I guess what are your feelings kind of on that do you feel that's perhaps less maybe could have expected it to be more really given everything going on in the the political and economic landscape we've we've had over the past few weeks well i don't i, I I'm, I'm barely qualified to comment i i think uh, uh there's probably people on here that are <laughs> far better far better qualified to comment on this than me um uh, the fact is that it, it, it it's 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 difficult to say isn't it the the um the situation is 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 going to be fluid, and and, and fluid situations are generally bad for property sales, mm -hmm. um, and interest rates are high, um, and no one knows whether they're going to go up or down. There are some pretty scary predictions about very very high rates before they drop back down. So, I think in, in, people are unlikely to go and invest and buy in, until they they see the color of the money as it were mm -hmm. from whoever is the chancellor next and whether he has any ability to stabilize markets and um and bring things under control i saw moody's downgraded um the uk mm -hmm. economy again over the weekend not not because of any particular prime minister but just because of instability so um uh until until that that um problem is resolved i don't see any particular improvements completely um brilliant. Well, well thank you very much for that i guess the final fun kind of 10 minutes here will take to just open the floor to some questions i'm being fed some as we speak so a carbon monoxide alarm required if a boiler is in a garage or on an outside wall is one required um or in a cupboard I was just so not being in living spaces well this is this is quite a good <laughs> it's a good nature of this um they, well it, it's only required whether properties use wholly or partly as living accommodation mm. but living accommodation isn't defined <laughs> um, <laughs> um so I, I don't entirely have an answer to this um uh in my experience local authorities treat living accommodation as including garages mm -hmm. um if you had a, a boiler on an exterior wall, I don't see how you could because they're not normally waterproof. Mm -hmm. So it couldn't, couldn't be open to the environment. If it was in a garage, it does violate one or two other um, building regs, but but um, I suspect you'd find the local authority might still say it was living accommodation. Mm. There you go. So better safe than sorry, I think, is the, the one on that one to an extent in terms of garages. Um, uh, given the cost of carbon monoxide alarm, I wouldn't mess around. Interesting, brilliant. Um, so where the boiler is in the loft space and the manufacturer's instructions just say it should be mounted between one to three metres of the appliance with no guidance on loft space, would you say it should be in the loft or on the landing under the loft space? I would put it on the landing under the loft space. Yeah. Carbon monoxide is heavier than air, it will drop downwards. Okay, there we go. Nice and quick one to, to that one. Um, there you go. There's a request to send out the link to your book. So where, where can we direct people for the, the new HMO book that's come out today? And of course, your press tour will continue throughout today. Um, on oh, I'm, I'm, hoping right. <laughs> um, uh, but I'm sure we can. I, know. I will find a link. And find the link and, and issue it out. Put it into the, I can put it in the chat, I think, can't I, on, on this one? There we go. There yeah, it is. should be able to. Brilliant. If I, if I find the chat function um there is a link to the routledge website where i believe you can buy it there you go i think i've sent that direct to laura so laura will have to send it out to everybody oh there you go laura please do i haven't got, got the ability finish. to write to everybody i've sent it to laura laura hopefully can <laughs> make it available <laughs> to anyone who wants to see it 
we can definitely share that. I'm sure with the the summary of this this webinar that goes out, we can we can pop the link in in there also. Um, another kind of questions, I guess, linking back to yeah the political economic landscape that we that we found find ourselves in. Um, is it fair to assume that the current governmental change will merely kick the white paper into the long grass pending the next general election? I guess we've talked about a bit about timescales, but into the long grass all the way until the next general election. What what are your kind of thoughts on that? No, I don't think so. Um, again, you don't treat the white paper as a monolithic entity. It's a <laughs> it's a men, it's a it's a menu of choices. Mm -hmm. um, will some of those choices be kicked into the long grass? Yes. Will all of them be kicked into the long grass? Probably not. So, so I, I, I'm fairly confident that you'll find that the decent home standard of the PRS will go forward. I'm fairly confident you'll find that the property portal will come into effect. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't place money on any other item coming into effect. But those first two might come into effect relatively quickly because they're non-controversial and they're fairly short. You can be done as fairly short bills or shoehorned into something else. Okay, interesting. And that reference to the long grass, I'm sure, is describing the, the grass behind you behind you today so, so <laughs> absolutely yeah. I, I, I i didn't pick my background like it with any <laughs> with any planning i'm afraid okay um do you think consideration oh do you think there will be consideration of periodic tenancies being unsuitable for the student sector i know we touched upon this a bit in a previous webinar um but of course with yeah students then serving notice and serving notice and just being there for the the kind of eight months um of the, the school year yeah. the academic this year is... what, what are your kind of thoughts on that this is really difficult. I mean, one, the purpose-built student accommodation sector does have an exemption anyway. So for, for some of the student sector, they're, they're already getting an exemption. The difficulty you've got is that the NUS has always, as a, a major policy position, taken the view that, that students shouldn't be offered a worse tenancy deal than other people. Mm -hmm. Um, so if everyone else is getting periodic from the start and the students are getting fixed terms, um, that is a worse tenancy deal. But I mean, the first point I would make is I wouldn't be at all convinced, even if we got rid of Section 21, that, that fixed term tenancies would disappear. I, I, I find that unlikely, actually. Mm -hmm. um, whether the student uh, whether whether the student sector will get a, a, a deal for everybody will, will get some sort of deal i can't say at the moment it's not looking that way the view of government to some extent is that is that students would leave anyway so what's your problem mm -hmm. um i mean the response to that is well what if they stay uh, there's a degree of certainty about the current situation <laughs> but of course bear in mind there isn't i mean if if I offer a one-year tenancy to students and they don't leave at the end of the fixed term, actually, it's going to take me several months to get possession in, in through the courts. Mm -hmm. um, but I suppose it's a it's a difference between um, encouragement and a structure that 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 favours them leaving, mm -hmm. and a structure that doesn't favour them leaving. Um, um, uh, <sighs> How, how strong a, a you know a, a change that actually is it's hard to to be sure about i i don't think that i don't think the government really has a clear plan on this they're a bit they're a bit all over the place on this one i'm afraid no oh, completely um another question that's just come in we submitted a, a section 21 to court in december um 2021 and still haven't got a date is there anything that can be done not really no um, I mean, uh, that seems unusually long. Um, mm -hmm. If you've not heard anything from the court, I would be phoning them up and ask them where it is and whether they processed it. But processing in courts is just awful at the moment. Um, some of the London courts take 40 days to open an item of post. Um, if you get a possession order, most possession orders are 14 days, a standard, but it takes over 20 days at the moment to actually get it typed up. Until it's typed up, you can't get the county court bailiff to act on it. So tenants are actually in practice getting 20 plus day position orders in London. Mm -hmm. um, there isn't a huge amount you can do except to make complaints to the court, uh, the court manager, which I do regularly at the moment. It doesn't seem to help me a great deal, but at least it keeps my paralegals busy. Um, and, and things are only likely to get worse. I mean, the reality is that the, that, uh, the reduction in, um, in evictions during COVID is gone. 
um, you've now got a situation where the Welsh legislation that was holding uh, things back has, has gone. Um, private sector, uh, sorry, social sector landlords who were tending to hold back are now starting to evict again. So the number of evictions is going up and up and up. Mm -hmm. And actually, things are getting worse. The um, most recent uh, competition for new district judges left uh, only filled two thirds of the available places. There are 16 circuit judge vacancies across England at the moment, which are unfilled. The government can't fill them because no one wants to become a judge at the moment. It's not a terribly attractive deal. Um, and the working environment's not great. Um, uh, so, so, that, so there is a real shortage of judges. There is a shortage of court buildings because the government keeps closing them, saying they don't need them, but they really do. Mm -hmm. um, and if you get rid of Section 21, by extension, you will get rid of accelerated possession proceedings, which means every possession will need a court hearing, um, which um, potentially puts more loading on the courts. And I don't think the government's really thought through how that's going to alter things. They, they, they're talking about... Uh, a digital system which is coming into effect independently of anything in the white paper which they think speed things up by reducing landlord error but i don't really see that as being terribly productive because of course I'm, most of my papers that go in don't have mistakes on them and it doesn't <laughs> doesn't make things any faster for me um so uh i don't i'm not convinced that the government's fully appreciated the problem so i think it's actually going to get things get worse my my general view is is whenever you if, you if you is to try and settle. I've always said to people, your prospects of covering rent arrears are quite poor. Mm -hmm. And if you can write off the rent arrears and the tenant will leave on that basis, then I would do it unless it's some ludicrously insane amount of money. Because in most cases, you won't get the money back. Mm -hmm. And you're far better to move the tenant out and um, rent to someone who's, um, who's going to pay you. But that's not sustainable across across the economy as a whole longer term, because that just means that you have large amounts of debt building up. So I, I would rather the government did something about the court service, but they would have to invest money to do that. And that's not really on the cards. I'm I think I think you've touched upon it nicely there, but just some kind of final things, just comments on court timings and reform. And you've kind of mentioned there that the intended reform, or as it is at the moment, could potentially just yeah increase the, the loading on the courts, really. Yeah. Stuff. Um, other guys, well, it's, it's three minutes too. I think we'll take those two or three minutes back for everyone's busy working Mondays. Um, but yeah, please do reach out to, of course, David. If you have any questions directly um, or seeking legal legal counsel, uh, and myself, if yeah, if you want to know anything more about about fixed flow. Uh, but thank you very much all for you for your time, particularly David. Pleasure, pleasure as always. Brilliant. Thanks very much. <laughs>